Hello, humans of the internet, and welcome. This is a this is a webinar that I've been really excited about for a long time. Really looking forward to you know talking about the things we're going to be talking about today, and talking with the special people that have uh, that have come to join me today. So I have here folks from a company called StepZen, and uh, have their CEO and Nant. And I Nant, I just just tell us about what is you know what is StepZen, and and what do you guys do? Awesome. So I, first of all, Joe, thank you so much for uh, inviting us. You and I have been chatting for the last few months and we are really excited about the opportunity. We are, uh, let me just actually flip to a slide which will, which will show uh, who the three of us are. And then I'll, let me just kind of talk about it. And then I also noticed that both Joel and Carlos are in high def and I'm not. So I'll have to kind of uh, make sure that I'm not so blurry the next time. But but uh, the company that we have is a, uh, is a company called StepZen. And what StepZen is all about is enabling you to build out your GraphQL API using building blocks, where you just snap building blocks together and, and connect. And then we take care of all the runtime issues with respect to monitoring the backends, ensuring the performance is right, taking care of your keys and everything else. So the idea really what we have is that how do we actually speed up your data integration needs for whatever your front end uh, needs are using GraphQL, and then we make assembling the GraphQL really, really easy. Our pedigree right. is that that Carlos and myself and a few other co-founders, we came from Apigee, that some of you might know of, which was an API company, and we learned mm -hmm. a lot about how APIs are built and should be built going forward in the future. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to have you here. And, you know, I'm coming to you from Agility CMS. So Agility has an API, you know, but I think talking specifically about GraphQL as an API, you know, I'm hoping that the folks that have joined today have either heard about GraphQL or maybe had some chance to play around with it as a concept. But I think the two things that are really exciting that StepSend does is, first of all, it exposes all the API as a GraphQL endpoint. And we're going to hear more about why that's important, but also ties together all of these different places. That's not easy to do. Carlos, why don't you, can you just introduce yourself and tell us about, you know, what makes you excited about sort of this, this kind of uh, technology? Sure, absolutely. Um, my name is Carlos Eberhardt. As uh, not mentioned, we work together at Apogee, and I was really excited to join this new venture uh, once I got a chance to learn a little bit more about it. Um, I, I was sort of a dyed-in-the-wool REST API guy for a long time, mm. and I, I liked the simplicity and, and the ease of it. And when GraphQL first came around, I thought, ooh, this seems it's a little bit heavier, a little bit harder to think about um, until I started using it. And, and then... The real power of it, I think, and where I get excited about it is when we talk about taking different REST APIs or REST APIs and databases and combining them into a single API that's really easy to query. Um, and one of the things that I love about Steps In is that it makes that combining really easy. That could, could be a big job. I could have to write a lot of code, but we kind of take that away. Uh, so that's that's sort of what has me jazzed is that it's, it's um, amplifying the power of that API story. Yeah. Well, and, and what you guys have done is basically built a, a kind of a reference solution that's going to do that and show us that. Anant, why don't you take us through what you're going to be showing us today? Awesome. Thank you, Joel. And uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you all are. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure. And over the course of next next uh, 30, 40 minutes, we'll both walk you through through. Uh, kind of an e-commerce uh, scenario, how GraphQL actually helps, and then actually walk you through some code and demo that you can start using tomorrow uh, with respect to building out your e-commerce websites. So uh, so the, the primary use case that we're going to go after is e-commerce. As you all know, that e-commerce is really, really taking off. And, and if you really think about it, uh, e-commerce in 2020, one is supposed to be about 20% of the overall, overall commerce rate. And this is just an astounding growth, right? And of course, uh, uh, the events over the last year, year and a half have further accelerated this. And then Jamstack, as, you, as some of you know, is a way of bringing the best of static and dynamic worldview so that you can get kind of the performance of static websites delivered through a CDN 
and yet leverage APIs to actually connect with dynamic data. And so it so turns out that in e-commerce, you absolutely want the best performance and therefore Jamstack is, is, is uh, exactly right. But in, in e-commerce, you also want to be able to connect with some dynamic data like inventory and others. So you need to both be able to build kind of static uh, web pages as well as connect with, with uh, kind of dynamic data. And the two kind of coming together uh, really make uh, this, this new revolution with e-commerce where we're going to go from 20% to 30% to 40% is actually really going to take off because of all of this. But while you're all kind of excited about the prospect of e-commerce and perhaps the prospect of Jamstack, though you can do e-commerce without Jamstack and you can do Jamstack without e-commerce, the fundamental challenge, as Joel pointed out, is, is where is the data that actually powers the experience really coming from? What we have observed, what Joel observes, observed, what we have observed in, in, in our past experiences and in uh, talking to a lot of other customers and, and websites and others, that the e-commerce website fundamentally is built off at least two, possibly seven or more backends. There's, there is a content management system that is typically in control of the marketing team that deals with what the look and feel of your e-commerce website is, what not just about the images, but also all the content and blogs and marketing material and audience selections and everything else, all of that kind of comes out of the content management system. The, the merchant system deals with actual transaction taking and everything else. And then of course the two systems need to be in, in sync and that's kind of the horizontal line that kind of goes through. But what's really interesting and important is that typically while you might start with two, you actually say that, okay, now I need to add inventory and while inventory can sit in my merchant system, inventory really needs its own controls. I need to kind of be able to handle delivery and the delivery systems are always third party systems and I need to be able to connect to them. I need to be a handle recommendation, all that stuff. So while you kind of start with a core of two, you actually end up adding a lot. So your data that's powering your, your e-commerce actually comes from, from multiple sites. And therefore, all these arrows and connectivities are something that you have to manage and, and, and hydrate and keep, keep at it as you build out your, your e-commerce system. So the first system that we'll talk about is the content management system. And of course, uh, I'm slightly biased and of course, Joel is slightly biased, but, but in my view, content management system is the most important system in your e-commerce thing because it controls how the experience of your uh, of the customers that come to your website are it it uh, controls how promotion segmentations audience targeting etc is done and in good cmss again uh, agility being one of the awesomest ones that we have worked with your website pages are managed and implemented through your cms okay so so cms turns out to be really really important but cms needs to be API first, needs to be headless, so that you can actually build your favorite uh, experience as opposed to be tied to some look and feel that would actually come from, from that particular merchant provider. And that's why, because of the properties of headlessness, because of the property of managing CMS, web pages, and of course, being an awesome marketing system, uh, agility CMS is something that you should definitely take a look at and while there's not a plug for agility or anything like that, uh, we are really, really proud of our work with agility and with people like uh, Joel. Joel, have I spoken enough about agility and shall I move on or you want to add something out here? Well, I just wanted to outline that, I, I, first of all, I 100% agree with all the things that you're saying. But interestingly enough, the, the, the previous slide you talked about, you know, it actually seems complex in one point of view, but I've seen a lot of diagrams that are much more complex than that and it can, it can really get really complicated quickly. This was actually a brainstorm between you and I weeks and weeks ago where, hey, how can we show something with e-commerce? But there's a lot of use cases that bring together you know, e-commerce and whatever. But CMS, I agree, almost always is part of this solution of you know, bringing APIs together. And I think that you know, customers are now understanding that right from the you know, developers all the way up to big enterprises, seeing that, you know, this is an important sort of thing to architect out. So I love that you've, you've drawn this out as a sort of a simplistic view with the idea yes. that it can get real complex real fast. Uh, and that's uh, the value that you guys bring. 
that's that's exactly right. Thank you very much. Okay, awesome. So the second system, of course, is merchant system because while while the CMS system actually delivers the experience, you also have to take money because without money, there's nothing. Um, you don't actually have a business, and therefore the merchant system, the e-commerce system, as as they might be called, becomes kind of the second most important system, which manages prices, orders, payments, etc. And 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 revenue is de uh, delivered through that. And again, that merchant system also needs to be headless because you want to control the experience and you want to kind of manage the data through APIs. And while there are lots of merchant systems that come with a head, really increasingly the trend towards is to actually use it, use it as a, as a headless, as use it as an, a kind of API driven system. Yeah. And again, the choice is yours, but Shopify is ideal for building out uh, e-commerce system, right? So, so fundamentally, uh, You'll, you'll, you'll see that Shopify will do some CMS activities and everything else. But if you're of any moderate size, you actually really, really want the marketing team in charge of, of your content, promotions, look and feel, audience selection, and you want your e-commerce and merchant team to be in charge of products and prices and inventory and, and, and taking money. <clears throat> and, and you do really don't want to mix, mix and match the two. But over time, as, as Joel pointed out, you not only just have those two systems, but you have you have lots and lots of other systems. So as your needs evolve, you'll add recommendation, delivery, notification, all those nice clean lines that I drew in that that figure kind of blur, and you've got data that's flowing everywhere, and, and you've got APIs that are either run by your teams or run by your sister teams or run by third parties, and you've got to kind of just keep track of and manage all of it. You are going to add richer data, uh, it is no longer just just simple things. You're going to add variants. You're going to add add uh, m more uh, delivery systems. You will want to make some part accessible with login, some without login, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, you you'll have to manage keys. So the overall complexity tends to increase. You'll want to add dynamic data. You'll want to be able to customize what that what the uh, customer sees based on the weather. And you may want to show her the latest delivery status that may come live. So you're in effect, you are spending a decent amount of your effort in kind of managing and corralling all the backends that actually end up feeding, feeding the data that you've got to do. And then on top of it, you've got to be able to target new experiences, not just website. You've got to be able to target web, mobile, or increasingly even Alexa and Google Home services devices. So the net of it is that while data is sitting in these systems, which are exactly the right systems for, for it, your experience needs to bring this data together and deliver it in, in kind of the right world. And that is where we believe that GraphQL makes make building a lot of these experiences that much easier. As, as, um, as Carlos pointed out, many of us were, were kind of rest bigots, and then we, we, we fell in love with GraphQL as to how easy it makes for front-end people to get exactly the right kind of information. And so what we expect, that, that lovely simplistic figure or the complex figure and arrows going from here to there and everything else will get abstracted away behind a GraphQL layer. And we at StepZen are working closely with, with Agility and others to kind of provide the right GraphQL abstraction for you to actually build out your e-commerce website, your e-commerce app, or your e-commerce uh, Alexa, Google Home experience. And if you can do that, then, then you can focus on, on quickly, quickly assembling the backend views and, and uh, steps and provides a lot of starter uh, building blocks for you. But then you can actually focus really on, on the, the business at the hand, which is the e-commerce business. So why GraphQL? Uh, some of us have done, uh, I did SQL for, for two decades, did a lot of work at IBM and IBM databases and everything else. And SQL is just absolutely awesome in allowing you to actually ask for what you really want. But you have to basically both write everything and you have to really understand the backend systems. And, and as for those of you who have looked at SQL schemas and relational databases and others, the backend uh, lingo can be very, very different than the lingo that you're used to. And then on the other hand is the REST APIs, which are considerably less flexible. You get what you want, 
And really, it is a backend system that has made the decision of what data to expose to you. And in particular, because the backend people don't exactly know all the use cases, they tend to expose a lot of data to you. And you are left with the job of kind of filtering out the data and stitching the data and everything else associated with it. So on the one hand, you get a lot of flexibility, but you've got to write to a lot of flexibility. And on the other hand, you get very little flexibility, and you've got to kind of program your way around. GraphQL kind of gets it nicely in the middle. It came out of Facebook. The term is graph. It is really a query language for web APIs. And, and the idea really is that, that instead of full flexibility on the right-hand side or no flexibility on the left-hand side, it kind of draws a box. But within that box, you can actually ask any question. And you can connect the dots. You can, you can for the example that I was giving you, uh, you can, for example, say that, that for John Doe, the person that you actually know has signed up for your website, give me the status of his undelivered orders. And you can ask all of that in one query. There is, a, there is a box around it where different pieces and parts can be connected, but it's up to the front-end developer to actually go and ask. And it's really, really intuitive for the front-end developer to actually get, ask for what, what you want and get the data that you've asked for, as opposed to on the rest side that you have to kind of filter it out and then go fetch, fetch customer data and then go and fetch order data and then fetch the delivery data and kind of combine instead, they all kind of delivered in, in this world. So that's why we really love GraphQL. And, and we came from the two ends and we have fallen in love with GraphQL. And if you haven't, you should too, because most of you or many of you are JavaScript developers and GraphQL is really, really taking off among JavaScript developers. And by, by our estimate, uh, millions of you will actually become GraphQL developers over the course of the next few years. And you should definitely give it a, uh, give it a shot. So, so what e-commerce Jamstack therefore needs is really all the systems that I talked about, whether they're CMS, merchant system, inventory system, recommendation system, or delivery system, they have their own interfaces. Some have database interfaces, some of the more modern ones like Agility, have, have REST interfaces. Some of the even more modern ones like Agility have a GraphQL interface. You want to be able to connect to the right system, be able to bring them together. And then in the middle tier, you need to be able to normalize the data that's coming from this side or that side, stitch it together, handle different protocols, handle keys, handle performance, everything else. So, so if the middleware can actually take care of all of this for you, then the backends get abstracted away and you can just build your system against the GraphQL API that Carlos is actually going to show you. So we at Sebzen have got a particularly opinionated view of all of this. What we want is we want you to, to take the building blocks that we have. We have got a database building block that you can access using a directive called dbquery. We have a REST building block that, that you can access using a directive called REST. You've got a GraphQL building block that you can access using GraphQL. And with those building blocks, you're basically pulling in data from, from various backends and, and in the middle, you are actually normalizing and stitching them. And, and Steps in is taking care of all protocol translations, key handling, and all performance stuff that might come in, like when do you cache, when is the data stale, how do you actually build out uh, parallelism and everything else. The thing that I want to point out is, is that some of the more modern systems like Agility not only are headless in terms of providing REST APIs, but they've actually gone one step further and are providing their own, are providing awesome GraphQL APIs too that you should definitely check out. But the, I, but, the, but the central thesis is that even if a backend actually provides GraphQL API like Agility does, and you should definitely connect to it using, using GraphQL, you still need to combine different snippets and other things, and yeah. therefore you need this kind of middle tier that brings all of these things together. Can I, can I just ask a question, Anand, too? Yes. So I, I love this diagram because I see it so many, so often, like in my years as a solution engineer, uh, as a solution architect, I see people like to draw this because people want to, like corporations want to have their own API because it's a really powerful tool to deliver AP, data all over their, their, their company. So a couple questions that people aren't asking, but I know it's on people's minds. So that at DB query. So I could query my own database, even though it's not like, you know, I didn't do anything to make this data, you know, this, as long as steps in can contact my database, then I can basically involve that in an API. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That's exactly right. And 
I think the biggest thing that I've seen is a lot of these databases or whatever, they're old, they've had data in there for a long time, and they're kind of volatile and slow. Does steps in, does it help you help deal with that? He says, you know, it handles caching and parallelism. Does it handle making that more performant and kind of protecting the underlying layer a little bit? Yes, that's exactly right. So, so, so uh, I'll be just extremely, up. so first of all, in terms of our background, we are, some of us are kind of, uh, database weenies, as we like to call ourselves, and therefore uh, throw us uh, kind of a database problem and we'll optimize the heck out of it. And in particular, it's fairly easy to build out APIs on top of databases, but it's actually even easier to build out non-performant APIs on top of databases. Mm -hmm. okay? And therefore, we take the job of actually building out performant APIs on top of databases really, really seriously. But the, the second point I'll try to, I'll, I'll, I'll make, in fact, one of our, our leading customers, their, their primary use cases, they've got data in a multi-tenanted Postgres, and they want to be able to actually access it using GraphQL uh, uh, front end and be able, to, be able to kind of partition the data and, and, and make all of that happen. But the second thing that I want to actually just, just kind of uh, bring about is that, that handling performance and handling caching and handling keys and handling all of that stuff is, is really difficult, okay? And, and what you really want to be able to do is to actually apply smart optimizations so that you can actually make trade-offs between almost everything in computer science is a trade-off and we are trying to make exactly those kinds of trade-offs. We, we haven't, we have, I wouldn't say that we're getting an A plus grade yet, but if you look at our pedigree, that's somewhere where we actually will will actually get uh, try to get uh, really solid grades. Love it. I love that you you folks will do that, and so me as a developer, I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff, and it just gets taken care of for me. That's I think that's huge value. Awesome. And then if I if I can give you another example, uh, an example of parallelism, uh, it so happens is that 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 you want to kind of paint your top screen in in. Uh, let's say it's 500, 700 milliseconds. And, and you've got to kind of access two or three backends. Sometimes caching helps, sometimes caching doesn't help. But sometimes query optimization helps, sometimes it doesn't. But the thing that almost always helps is parallelism. Can you mm -hmm. actually go to multiple systems in parallel? And we try to understand what parts of your GraphQL queries are disconnected, with what are the parts, and can be executed in parallel and everything else. So we have, we have got a kind of a toolkit of fairly good good techniques, that's not the end of it, and we'll continue to work on it, but the idea is that, that your front end should not be waiting for, for uh, a spinning wheel yeah. for the data to be delivered through GraphQL. Love it. Okay, awesome. And if some part of it kind of errors out, then we try to finish the query for the part that is not dependent on others so that you can actually do certain things, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, so what I'm gonna do is just kind of set up the demo for you, and then Carlos is going to show you that this, this particular theory of, of GraphQL and steps and actually translates into practice. And, and if you look at that simple figure that we had, which of course Joel points out is never so simple, we have got kind of an instantiation of things. Uh, we are going to build out an e-commerce site using Next. We're going to deploy it uh, using, using Vercel on, on the Vercel CDN. So that will be kind of the Jamstack and e-commerce together. Obviously, the, the GraphQL layer will be in step Zen. The content management layer will be agility. And the merchant system will be Shopify. And we are not going to actually connect with, with others right now. But you'll just get an idea of how easy it is to actually abstract these things away. And, and the, the order in which uh, Carlos will show it, I think that's the order he's uh, showing it in is, first, we'll show you kind of finished finished website that's bringing data from everywhere. Then we're going to kind of peel the surface away. We're going to kind of set the website away. And then we'll actually look at just the data part of it and show how that data is actually being assembled from content system and from, from merchant system, in particular from Agility and Shopify. And then we're going to show also how that same layer can actually be used to transfer the data from uh, one system to the other. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to to Carlos, uh, and uh, Carlos, let me stop sharing, and then it's yours. Terrific, thank you. Let me get my screen sharing working. 
And once that's up, we should be uh, good to start. And I trust that you'll let me know if you're not seeing this commerce site. Um, as Anand mentioned, what we're going to do is kind of look at the finished product first and talk a little bit about that and, and how it works. And this is just sample data. Uh, we're using a framework called Next Commerce that Vercel has created that is a, a really complete framework for doing a Jamstack e-commerce site. Um, and you can see, you know, I can, I can search for things like backpack uh, and it comes up really fast, which is one of the great things about about any uh, Jamstack site is that we've essentially pre-built a lot of this stuff. So it's just static content, which means that when I want to, to view things and or sort through things, it's, it's all happening really snappily because it's all the data is just there. There are not requests going to a, a backend server that I can do things with. Now, typically this site is built to work with just a monolithic e-commerce platform. So um, Vercel's done a great job uh, but but it's it's very tricky to kind of combine data sources that way. So they have uh, pre-built solutions for Shopify, Big Commerce, etc. Um, but that's all that this site will talk to in their pre-built solutions. So the challenge that we took on was to say, okay, can we take this site, a pre-built e-commerce site uh, that's using a monolithic platform, and um, essentially create a, a, a composable digital experience platform using GraphQL and combine two different systems. And the systems we obviously decided to use were Agility CMS, which is fantastic for handling that, that content management side, and then Shopify, because that's just so prevalent. Um, and really we're looking at price and things like that are being handled on the Shopify side. So this is the, the deployed final static uh, app. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through um, a little bit about how we built it, and we'll take a look at uh, uh, one that I've got running locally so we can see what happens and, and sort of prove that data changing aspect to it. Uh, one thing I did want to mention about Jamstack sites uh, specifically is that you know, the, the idea behind this is that we, we pre-build this content. So the way that this deployment works is when the site is deployed, uh, we have it linked to a GitHub uh, um, repository. So any changes to the GitHub repository trigger a site deployment. That site deployment process runs GraphQL queries to retrieve all the data to build all the static content. One really cool thing Next can do is you can set um, something called incremental static regeneration. So it's lots of words, but essentially what it means is I can set sort of a time limit on pages. And if it's, if it's gone past that time limit, that individual page will rerun the queries that generated it. So what that means is I can, I can design my site and have it built. Um, I can make changes to my backend data, say in, I can change the price of an item. Um, if it's not critical, I can just wait because when uh, after that after that time limit kicks off, the next person that hits that site, it will regenerate the static content, pull in the new price, and then from now on, that price is on all the CDN endpoints that that Vercel's serving up. So I can really get out of sort of this Jamstack process of having to rebuild a site to deploy it whenever uh, you know the smallest thing changes. Um, of course, I can do that on demand if I want to. Uh, it is a pretty fast build process. So you're looking, you know, it's it's not hours, it's it's you know less than less than five minutes to do that. So it's not a big deal to do it, but it's a really nice feature, um, especially if you're, you know, thinking about high load situations. So I'm I'm in a situation on Black Friday when you know suddenly I've I I realize that I've got a mistake on the site and I need to fix it. Um, I can make sure that I take care of that and I'm not doing a complete redeploy and sort of stressing all of my systems at at the same time. So. Um, Again, very fast site, uh, really, really slick, designed to work with, with a, single, a single system. Um, we do have this available, and we'll, we'll share the link for this later, but it's in our public GitHub repo called Steps and Samples. It's called Vercel Commerce Steps in. You can check that out, um, download it, and run it yourself. And the recent blog post that we have published on the Agility site has uh, instructions that step you through the, the whole process on that. So, so here's my local copy that's running. Um, and let's go in and hit one of these pages and it takes a little bit of time because it's running locally. Um, and, and here we can see, you know, we've got a backpack, I've got a price coming in and I've got some, some marketing content here. Um, what I wanted to show you quickly was that I can change this marketing content. This is that, that same item. And here's my agility CMS. So I can add in 
you know, a little bit of, I'm not an HTML person, so HTML people are probably um, barfing at my use of the, the BR tag, but <laughs> do something like that. And if I just save this data uh, really quickly, um, and then if I come back to, to here and reload this page, now, since it's running locally, it's, it's actually going to retrieve and rebuild this page as I do it. And I can see now I've got content coming from Agility um, and I'm updating this. So I can have my content people running everything. They don't have to have access to my uh, Shopify store, which also has some content in it just by default, but we're not necessarily using all of that. But right. what price is here. So if I update price on this side, then I can I can pull this in again. If we watch that fifty, it should uh, should update. And again, this is this is running a, a now it's now it's fifty five dollars. So this is running uh, queries through GraphQL, um, basically the same query. It's a, it's running a single query to build this page. It's asking for this product information, and the query that it's running is pulling in information from from both of these systems. So if we take a look at, for example, some of the queries that we have about built out here, this is probably pretty small to see. Um, but I can see that I've got a, a query, and this will kind of explain how some of this stuff is, is tied together. If you're not familiar with GraphQL, this is the sort of thing that you do in GraphQL quite a bit. You, you say, I want to run this product's REST query, which is a named query. I'll show you the definition of that in just a minute. And it tells me it, it returns this product. The great thing about GraphQL is you can have inline docs on it. So if, if someone doesn't necessarily know what to use, they can, they can find it really easily. Um, I can run this query, and this is essentially making a query that's combining agility information with, with Shopify information. Um, and what we do is we've got a, a bit of that. We have this Shopify ID stored in the agility CMS. So now, now we can relate an agility CMS item product to a Shopify product and do queries to get price, et cetera. Um, and again, if I'm not interested in some of this stuff, I can just drop it out. This is from, from the front end developer's perspective. This is really nice because now I just, I'm only getting back the data that I care about for the page that I'm working on. So let's take a quick look at what um, some of this stuff looks like on the steps end side. Now we, we talked about how um, we make it really easy to plug in different, different things. And all I've shown you really so far is uh, a finished product website, which has code behind it and the, um, the ability to make changes in these different systems. And I see the code changes happening. What I haven't shown you is sort of how we hooked it all together and how we connected the site. So I want to talk about that a little bit now. I'm not going to go too deep because, um, again, this might this might get a little bit dry. But I wanted to sort of give an idea of 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 how how Steps in makes this really easy. Now, this is a fairly complex set of queries that we've built out because that that commerce site is pretty complex, it does a lot of different things. We've got full checkout capability and baskets and, and, and et cetera is, is all available on that site. So it is a complete and running thing you could deploy and run a store on, which means that it, it does require quite a bit of data. Um, and that's why some of, these, some of these schemas that we've defined, these GraphQL schemas are, are a little bit longer. Um, essentially, GraphQL is, is sort of driven by schemas. So if you're familiar with REST APIs, they don't really need a schema. Uh, it's essentially you can just make an HTTP GET and, and get data back, and that data can change, etc. GraphQL is a little bit more um, strict on that. It's got type definitions and and uh, schemas defining what queries are and what data they return, uh, and that's one of the great powers of it. it initially, it, it turned me off because it seemed a lot harder to do, but with that extra little bit of of um, structure, it allows you to really connect things together and do some interesting things. So just quickly, um, what we've got in steps in is we have uh, schemas that are defined that that tell us you know what queries are available. And, and I ran this product's rest query, which told me that it, um, the product types from from both agility and Shopify and retrieve data from them. And the way this works in steps in is a 
we've got we've got this is a little bit more of a detailed one that's got some some kind of advanced features we're actually running three queries together to get all of that data so the first query we, we run is to just retrieve all the shopify products and i'll show you what that one's like and then we essentially run another query that says give me the agility products by shopify id so steps in smart enough to say i've got a list of shopify products that have shopify ids now I want to take and feed that into this next query so I can get all of the data from Agility for that. And then the last step we do is called the collect step, which says, okay, take everything that we've got and turn it into a type that looks like this. So can I, can I hold you up for one second? Yeah, absolutely. Please do. Yeah. So what we're looking at right now is the steps and workspace, right? Yeah, this is actually, I'm just in Visual Studio Code. Um, steps in is configuration driven. So we do have a steps in folder in that repo that I talked about, and it has a few different files in here. But these are the files essentially that, that configure your steps in endpoint to do things. Um, so we've got uh, queries defined. These are the types of queries I can run. I also have types defined, which are the the you know, the data types for, right. for what's coming back. So whether it's a Boolean or a string um, yeah. and we have mutations, obviously e-commerce platform, you're going to be changing data. It's not just about reading stuff. So we have mutations to find um, and, and all of that stuff as well. Okay. So you use GraphQL to define the GraphQL that you're going to get out. I love it. Okay. This is exactly. awesome. Yep, yep, schema-driven stuff. Um, and again, there is there is a bit of a learning curve to GraphQL if you're not familiar with it, but it's it happens pretty quickly. It's not a steep one. You just sort of need to get used to the idea of, you know, instead of just issuing a Git and getting some JSON data back, I actually kind of have to describe what that data is going to be. Um, and by doing that, it allows the GraphQL engine, in this case, steps in to say, oh, if you want to connect this field to this other field, we can do that because, you know, I know what those fields are. Right. So, so just, just in terms of kind of, uh, can you just go to a kind of a, the, the type system? Just hang on for a second. Yeah, sure. Uh, just, 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 just scroll up to one of the types. So, so fundamentally uh, in GraphQL, there's a concept of, of types, which are really kind of business level constructs that your, your e-commerce website or any site would deal with. So for example, product is a business level con construct and it's got title and description images, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. What, the, what in steps in, what you have to do is to say, okay, how is that system level, con business level construct really hydrated, okay? So what is the call that I need to attach to that business level construct so that when the developer, when you are requesting that business level construct, how does that data actually come through? And in that context, fundamentally, as I told you, in step Zen, you either connect to a backend using a REST call or you connect to a backend using, uh, so uh, scroll down to a REST call here, uh, if you don't mind. That will be over in the, uh, in the query side because this is just the types. Yeah. So, so, uh, let me jump to, to this one quickly for you or not. So for example, here we are saying that uh, to get Shopify product, you issue this query against Shopify, okay? And all the kind of secrets and others get stashed away somewhere else. So they're not part of this code. And, and we are saying, remember that we're making a REST call, pull this field out and pull that field out. And there, that is how you actually populate uh, the Shopify product, okay? So in effect, what you're really doing is you are assembling these bits of building blocks using REST or others. And then now if you kind of go back to the top layer, uh, again on the kind of the type system. <clears throat> so, so, and then what you say, okay, that's awesome. Now I've got these bits and pieces that have come together. How am I going to actually stitch these pieces together, okay? And the stitching mechanism happens by saying, look, when you are in the context of this type, call this query. And now when you call this query, this piece of data will actually show up. So for example, here in the context of product, we are saying that to populate the, the variance data, issue a particular query, which will itself be a rest query or to populate images data, issue a different rest query. 
So what you are basically doing is you are assembling those intersections and bits and pieces by actually combining them. And really, the GraphQL queries are used to actually stitch the data into something else. OK? This is, I have, I have to interject. This is genius level stuff. The middleware that used to be involved, I've been in the IT industry a long time in tech industry. The middleware that you used to have to do or write yourself to do this level of sort of connecting and data, bring it together, as we said before, is not only really complicated, but really hard and really hard to maintain. I love how simple and declarative this is. This is, I, I congrats guys on making like, to me, this makes, as, as a developer, it makes perfect sense for how to stitch APIs together, especially when they're totally disparate data. They're completely different pieces of data being joined by an ID. Awesome. Keep going. I, sorry about interrupting you, Carlos, no, but this, no, is, no, this exactly. is fabulous. Yeah. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. And we, and we actually got to what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> we, okay. we just I kind of came in at the at the top end instead of instead of the bottom end. But this is this is where we were really going to end up was talking about how stitching things together is super, super simple once you kind of understand how to talk to these, yeah. these different back ends and using rat at rest is a really clean way to make a rest API call. And this is one of the things I, I know you'd mentioned earlier, you know, what gets me excited about steps in this is this is a, in a nutshell is is sort of the core thing that got me excited in in coming to it from a sort of a rest API guy um, and thinking about, okay, well, you know, I'm going to get a list of this and I'm going to get a list of that and I need to kind of merge these things together. I'm going to have to write code to do that. Now I don't um, because mm -hmm. I, I simply do configuration driven stuff. I teach steps in how to talk to one system, two systems, three systems. And then as long as I can, as long as I can query those systems to get the data I want, I can connect everything up. And then on the front side, from a GraphQL query perspective, I just issue the one request that gets me all the data that I want to do. And it, it fans out and talks to, as I not mentioned, oftentimes in parallel, at as many different systems as it, need, as it needs to, to sort of combine and, and create that response data for me. Yeah. And again, another great thing, this is where GraphQL is, is fantastic, is that instead of getting every response from, from Shopify, every, every item, every bit of data that's in that Shopify response and every bit of data that's in the agility CMS response, I just say, I just, I want this ID and that ID and description, and I can use that. So for example, on a search results page, instead of getting every bit of detail about that, about that product, I don't need to, I just, I only ask for what I want. Right. And, and just quickly, I, if we look at the configuration data, this is another, um, another little, a little thing that we've got in the repo that talks about this is a not mentioned taking care of secrets and things like this. It's very simple to just say, okay, you know what? Here's my API key, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then I can I can have you know my actual one here is in my Git ignore, so it doesn't go into my repository, and I don't have to worry about that. Uh, but I can drive all of this stuff um, in in a, a very simple way to to basically keep my secrets safe. Um, steps in uses them, but doesn't doesn't really know them, right? To to call these different backends, and then I I combine this data together. Um, and this is the steps in config. Now, for this site, was fairly complex uh, because it was a complete e-commerce solution. If you're interested in learning more about how that works, um, what I would recommend is going to the uh, steps in website and and jumping into the docs, and we've got a, a quick set of of walkthroughs with some with some really simple and clean uh examples of, of of how to get some very simple things taken care of so that you can kind of get over that initial learning curve without having to jump into the deep end uh right away and 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 you can you can progress through some of the tricks with materializers and sequences and and all sorts of things like that okay so just to hold on for one sec so basically steps in as an npm package that I install as a software development kit that I just use as part of my project. And you guys have built like probably one of the most valuable use cases and just given it away for free. So that's awesome. That's, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah. I get goosebumps when I think about that because like all of that work just done really complicated, you know, you can go back up and see the simple side of it, but it's like, here's the really complicated one that you could design your own system from. Um, that's awesome. Yep. Yep. And, and once you get used to, 
sort of the 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 idea of using configuration to drive how you can connect these systems into a single GraphQL API. The steps to going from something simple to something more complex and something you know even as complex as a complete Jamstack e-commerce site, they're yeah. not that big. Um, each each step sort of makes sense and builds on the next one. So it's it's not a situation where it's you know sort of the old draw the owl joke, right? Do two circles and then draw the rest of the owl. We we haven't really done that. There's there's the docs help you learn to get to to what you need to do. Okay, I th I think unless there unless either of you gentlemen have any other questions, uh, I think we can we can wrap up the demo side. That was pretty much all we wanted to show in terms of that. Again, just reminders: um, steps in free to use and sign up and and try. And we've got good intro docs to get you started. The the storefront is open source. Um, we're actually working with Vercel as well to see if we can get our steps in solution as part of their core package. Uh, they were they were really interested to see what we had done as well. So that that may be coming down the line. Awesome. OK, uh, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, fantastic work with, uh, with with everybody here. OK, so so one thing that Carlos didn't show was that that in addition to kind of your price changes showing up, and your your whatever HTML uh, BR tag that he added, uh, new promo and all that stuff showing up, which actually happens in the arrows that go up and down. Sometimes you also need to kind of manage the data to flow from one system to the other. Mm. Because after all, you don't want to create product in two places. You want kind of common product data to actually flow through. And all of those are also extremely straightforward with both steps in and GraphQL, because in effect, uh, all you do is you set up you you set up the way to kind of look for change stuff. Agility, for example, makes it really really easy to understand content that has changed, and you can you can slip the content that has changed and and fire off a mutation on the other side, so that data actually shows up. Or in or you can you can watch for changed new product added on the on the merchant side and slip them. So so with GraphQL. You kind of get this mechanism where, where not only can data be fed into the application through the API, data can actually move horizontally by just managing and watching for change data and issuing mutations on the other side. So in the code that you'll get, if you if you all go and look at it, you'll see uh, this kind of horizontal data transfer also. So so can I just interject for one second, just like yes. GraphQL education here. So I have, I have a GraphQL has a thing called a query, which is to read data. And then a, what's a mutation? Can you explain that just a little bit for some of these folks? Yeah, so mutation is just a fancy term for updates. Okay, so, so in, in, in database land, we would have called these kind of CRUD operations, uh, create, update, delete, and create, update, deletes are mutations in GraphQL land and retrieve is query. Okay, right. so, so, the, so the way this works is, uh, is that you issue a query against the system which is the source of the data and you issue a, a create, update, or delete on the target system. And that is how you actually ensure that the horizontal data can be kept in sync. And therefore, a query combined with a mutation leads to data being transferred from one system to the other. And, and all you do is you kind of set up a sequence which says first query and get me all the data that has changed. As I said, Agility makes it really easy or Shopify makes it really easy. And you say for each bit of data that has changed, go and do something on the other system and using mutations. Does that answer your question, Joel? It, sure, it certainly does, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really important. No one ever explained that to me for GraphQL and I had to learn the hard way. I, and I think I just learned it the right way. So that's great. Uh, you've learned it at least the uh, Anant way, so that may be the right, may be right or wrong. That okay. is a really good point, Anant. Though, I, and I, I just wanted to mention that that um, a lot of times we talk about GraphQL APIs as sort of being driven by the the application that's consuming them, because that's such a great feature that someone can sort of decide what data they want to get back. But once you do have those set up, I'm I'm kind of an old enterprise architect guy. 
what I really like about it is that you can get sort of a very consistent method for doing lots of things, exactly the sort of thing that Anant just talked about. If I've got a, a system that's composed of multiple systems and I need to keep data in sync, that's not really a concern that I want the front end side to worry about. Right. But once I've got these queries set up and the mutations defined, that API that I built starts to serve double duty. Now I'm, I'm using it to handle ETL, you know, classic old ETL type stuff. Um, and it's all contained in one spot. My security is all handled in one spot. Again, we're kind of falling over into enterprise concerns, but there's a lot of really interesting benefits you can pull from, from doing something like this. Certainly. Awesome. Okay, uh, fantastic. I'm, uh, so, so what you saw from, from uh, Carlos, uh, you use REST to connect to backends. You get these kind of building blocks, uh, get product data, get changed product data, get variant data, get something else, all using these kind of REST calls. And we can actually introspect the REST backend. And or if you give us examples, we can auto-generate it. We didn't get a chance to show all of it, but if you've got an open API backend, open API spec, you can, you can fetch it. That's how we actually uh, did the work with, with Agility. They have an awesome open API spec, but you can give us examples and we can auto-generate it. Then you combine the data using declarative context. Basically, the idea is that in this context, how do you fetch in some related data? And we've got a, a directive called, called materializer, but it's just basically a declaration, which says use this to get there. Uh, you can handle uh, all queries and all mutations declaratively. A very important thing is that you want to be able to separate the configuration from the, from the schema. You want to kind of have a life cycle of configuration, the keys, uh, access control, policies, et cetera, separate from what the front end experience is with respect to the APIs. You want to be able to separate it. And as, and as we said, everything that we saw is actually running as an endpoint. Uh, our tagline is we carry the pages so that you don't have to be basically uh, monitoring the back end and saying, okay, do we need to insert yeah. a cache here, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, awesome. So, uh, so Jamstack driven e-commerce experiences super fast. CMSs like Agility CMS and Shopify are pillars, but over time, many more systems become central and the complexity and, and you are spending a lot of time in kind of managing those backends instead of direct API calls sorry, to the... I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, and I didn't... I'm glad I you didn't hear Siri. what I said. It was not meant for you, Siri. I don't know what, what is the keyword that I used that called it. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I don't say either sorry or Siri. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And, and then instead of direct API calls, you use a GraphQL layer, and then StepZen can, uh, can and we want StepZen to be that layer. And, and with Joel and John and, and, and all of us, we are working closely together, and we would love to work with, with, with you, your teams, and others in terms of your use cases where the data sits in, in agility, and the data sits in, in other systems, but, but all of the data needs to be kind of corralled and brought together. Uh, where to go from here? Uh, you can read more about it. Olga has already posted the, the link to the, uh, to the blog. You can, uh, in that, you'll get the, uh, the, the, the GitHub samples, but if you want, you can just, just type uh, keywords of, of steps and agility, and you'll be actually be able to access this uh, it's available, and then you should uh, take both Agility and, and which is an awesome CMS, and Steps in for a sim uh, uh, for a spin. And if you want to learn more about Steps in, do hit us up on our Discord, uh, which is here. Okay, with that, uh, again, thank you very much, all of you, for your time. Thank you, Carlos, and most importantly, thank you, Olga and Joel, for giving us the opportunity to interact with you all. Oh, this has been great. Yeah, and, uh, and Carlos, thanks for joining me. And I, I really just look forward to, you know, working with not only not only a company like StepSend, because I think the idea is you are a group of people that are like, first of all, you're all super smart, you know, and you're coming from an industry where it's like, we've solved all these problems or we've been affected by these kind of problems. And we're going to solve it in this way that I think is really interesting, exciting, and really easy. So that as opposed to having to like, you know, when I'm thinking up my solution for my API, I don't have to dig a hole and build a foundation. I can start at the 20th floor and just decorate the penthouse kind of thing. That's how, that's how I see it. Awesome. it on the yeah. shoulders of giants. So this is wonderful <laughs> awesome. that we have this awesome example that you've given away. 
um, for free so that you know developers can bring bring together all their data because I think it's one of the hardest problems to solve and one of the most important things to solve as a piece of building a, a great enterprise great solution. Um, so that's awesome. Join the Discord. Uh, check out the agility events for the upcoming events. Lots more webinars to come. And uh, Anant and Carlos, can't wait to have you back on the show again and talk to you more in the future. Everyone, thanks for joining. This has been amazing. And uh, everybody, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.